Well, good evening, everyone. I'm David Lewis, and <clears throat> I'm honored to be your speaker this evening. Thank you for joining us at Mission Dharma. Um, just a couple of introductory uh, notes that I want to make while people are still signing on. Um, if I should just turn off my video and disappear from the screen <clears throat> for 30 seconds or so, uh, not to worry. I'm having a little trouble with my eyes and I have to put eye drops in and about every half an hour or so. I won't subject you to that <clears throat> if I remember to turn off the video. Um, and I also just wanted to acknowledge uh, the news of the day because it's probably much on everyone's minds as it is, has been on mine. And yesterday I gave a talk <clears throat> and another Sangha about um, um, skillful ways of responding and also ways of uh, sitting with difficulty, difficulty in the news, whether it's difficulty in the news or difficult of our, difficulty in our own lives. And <clears throat> I'm not gonna give that talk tonight because I wanted to <clears throat> just get off the topic and talk about something a little bit more upbeat. So I thought we might need it. But I will tell you, the, the um, kind of the outcome, or the conclusion I came, reflecting on how do we respond to difficult times in the Buddhist community. And that conclusion was, is that <clears throat> there's no refuge like the present moment. And so the most powerful response outside of something that you can do practically to change the world or change circumstances of your own life is to be fully present because there's peace in the present moment. There's always peace available in the present moment, present moment, no matter what's going on in your life or in the world. Uh, so I understand we're having some problems with sound. So let's just meditate. Um, I'll give very short instructions because I suspect I might be, I can't hear it, but I might be echoing or something. Um, and how he's going to work on fixing it. Uh, so, um, Howie, if, if you want me to stop speaking, uh, send me a chat message and I'll just stop. But for the rest of us, in the meantime, Please find a comfortable seat, comfortable position, a posture in which you can relax. And yet remain alert. So that may be sitting in a chair or on a cushion, it may even be lying down. Just settle into your posture. A relaxed body lends itself to a relaxed mind. And that's our instruction for tonight, to simply relax. Try to be fully present with whatever's happening without judging, without trying to make anything happen or make anything different without even trying to create peace of mind, simply noticing what the body's doing and what the mind's doing. Perhaps starting with the felt sense of being in this body in its seated position. Feet on the floor, 
body touching a chair or a cushion. There's nothing more present, nothing more here and now than being embodied. The mind may wander into the past or the future, or it may want to drift into the news of the day, but the body remains present. So it's a refuge. And a refuge might be just what we need this evening. Bringing the attention to the breath, which is another aspect of being embodied. Like your sense of touch, the breath always happens in the present moment. So it's a reliable anchor for our meditation. If the mind wanders off or we get lost in thought, with mindfulness at some point we'll notice that's happened. We can bring our attention back to the breath or the felt sense of being in the body and ground ourselves once again in the present moment. As many times as you need to throughout meditation. Tonight our task is to be kind to ourselves. Find some respite from the worries of the day. Letting go of whatever preoccupations you may have been carrying. They will be there to pick up later if they need to be. For now, just give yourself a break. Simply rest in the present moment. Letting your breath, your body, and for that matter, all five sense doors ground you in the present moment. If you hear a sound, that's happening in the present moment as well. It's not an interruption, just noise. Noise being heard in the present. We try to simplify our experience. Thoughts may arise as they are want to do. If we don't engage with them, we don't follow our thoughts and pass away. Rise and pass just as quickly as a sound. So thoughts, thoughts and feelings are not a problem in meditation. You simply allow them to rise, pass away. Notice their temporary nature. As with all conditioned phenomena. and relax. Perhaps letting your eyes gently close if you're okay meditating with your eyes closed. Turning the gaze inward. Noticing if any of the other sense doors open up when you close your eyes. All the senses happening in the present moment. As the body starts to settle, the mind will settle. 
We can allow the mind to settle into the body in the same way that the body is settled in its seat. Relaxing. Letting go of any expectations of anything that you think is supposed to happen in meditation or not happen. Those are just ideas. As the mind settles, we may open up our awareness to any other phenomena inviting our attention. Sounds, thoughts, feelings, they all have a common nature of impermanence. They all change. Simply a flow of phenomena, as if you were sitting by a river, watching it pass. The river might be full of fish, insects, sticks and leaves. You simply let it flow on by being the observer. Watching our mental and physical phenomena, it's like watching that river pass by. It can be a profoundly peaceful experience if we just let it flow. Simply letting our experience be whatever it is. And if some particularly demanding thought or story arises, we get caught up in something. It's not a problem. You simply notice that's happened. It's a moment of waking up with mindfulness. And we can let go of whatever the distraction was. Bring our attention back to the breath or the body. Start our meditation again. Nothing wrong happens in meditation. Our job is to simply notice the rising and passing of phenomena. Letting it be. So I'll just be quiet for a while and invite you to attend to your own experience. Now ring a bell at the end.
If the mind has wandered, simply notice that's happened. It's a moment of waking up. Let go of whatever the distraction was. Ground yourself once again in the present moment. And start again.
Um, Howie, I think we, this is when we usually do announcements, but if you're still having a sound problem, I can just go right into the talk. I think I fixed it. Great. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you okay. So I apologize for interrupting you because it seems the sound problem was strictly my own <laughs> and no one else was being affected, but I didn't realize that. So I had to interrupt the beginning of your talk. No I'll problem. make this brief. Um, <clears throat> there is a uh, a way to give Donna uh, to our Sangha. Uh, for those who don't know the word, it, it means to uh, make a uh, a donation of of uh, generosity. Um, everybody involved uh, is doing this. Uh, without pay but we like to try to uh, thank the teachers who sit in Howie's seat and also to take care of business whatever that means but mainly it's the way to keep the dharma going it's the way to keep the word uh and the practice going uh, especially here at mission dharma for 30 plus 35 plus years so if you can uh I know there's a lot of wonderful and needy causes to uh, help people out with, especially lately. But um, if you can uh, afford to make a, a Dharma donation, uh, you can look in the chat. I just uh, popped in a, a few ways that you can do it. And <clears throat> and um, I, uh, we all could say it's, uh, it's valuable. So, um, that's that. Uh, back to you, David. Thank, thank you for that, Howie. Let's see. No, uh, just want to make reference one more time respectfully that I know that many of you, like myself, have heavy hearts tonight and perhaps troubled minds, thinking about the victims of the invasion of the Ukraine and worrying about the welfare of two million refugees. Uh, speaking of Donna and generosity, that's a wonderful place to, uh, I, I intend to send some money to the um, International Red Cross or maybe Doctors Without Borders. In our sorrow, uh, we should not be too surprised. This is what nations do. This is what we humans are capable of. This is what inhumanity looks like. The inhumanity that is the result of greed, aversion, delusion, and ignorance. The Buddha talked about. And also the absence of goodwill, compassion, respect for lights, rights, and freedoms of others. So a skillful Buddhist response is to start with ourselves, to practice letting go of our own craving and cultivating the Brahma Viharas, metta, compassion, and even times like this, joy and equanimity. Peace begins within. I know how he likes this quote from Nisargadatta, it's, I got it from him, and so you may have heard it recently. It bears repeating times like this. Mr. Gadatta said, the world is the way it is because people are the way they are. As long as people are the way they are, the world will continue to be the way it is. If we want to have a peaceful world, it's necessary to have peaceful people. Peace is not something that, you could, that can be imposed on the world. So I mentioned at the beginning that I um, decided not to give a talk about how to sit with challenging times. It just seems like it might just remind us of the troubles of the world. And I'd like to talk about something else. Um, 
not out of disregard for the events of the day or for whatever's going, might be going on in your life, but rather as a reminder that no matter what is going on in the world or in your life, peace is available to us. Ours is the path of freedom. So this evening, I would like to talk about liberation. Some years ago, I was sitting a month-long retreat at Spirit Rock. And on the very first morning of the retreat, at the very first question and answer session, the yogi put up his hand and asked the teachers when he could expect liberation. The question received a collective titter from the room. The teacher seemed momentarily baffled as to how to respond to it. Only a beginner would ask such a naive question. Like many of us, when we were new to Buddhism, he had read about enlightenment and decided that that was for him. And he'd signed up for this, his first retreat. I suspect we all felt bad about laughing. Um, I certainly did, but it was a kind of funny question. Who wouldn't want to know the answer to that? In asking about liberation, he was thinking about enlightenment or the realization of Nibbana, Nirvana in, in Sanskrit, Nibbana in Pali, the Buddhist language, the final liberation at the end of the path of practice and insight. If we're honest, most of us could probably relate to that, to his question. Nirvana certainly piqued my interest when I first read about it. I'd never heard about such, such a thing before. And it sounded wonderful. Nibbana is also called Panavimuti in Pali, the Buddhist language. Panavimuti means liberation by wisdom. And no, that is not the liberation that I'll be talking about tonight. For one thing, I've not experienced it myself, so I'm no authority. And for another, it's very difficult to describe as it lies beyond conceptual thinking and words. But I do have faith that it is real and achievable in this very lifetime. I can't remember how the teacher answered this question now, except I do remember she was very kind. She probably said that we don't try to predict the future as it doesn't actually exist, but that whenever we do experience liberation, it will be in the present moment. Liberation was not the theme of that retreat, but she could have gone on to explain that there is another type of liberation described in the suttas, the teachings of the Buddha. This other type of liberation is called sito vimuti, or liberation of the mind. Sito vimuti refers to a temporary liberation from the hindrances of greed, aversion, and delusion. This temporary liberation also only happens in the present moment, but it can happen to anyone, anytime, even on your very first retreat. Even perhaps the first time you meditate. I heard another retreat and story. This one was told by a Dharma teacher who was describing his wife's experience on her very first retreat. She came home from the retreat and this Dharma teacher asked how it went and his wife described what sounded like Sito Vamuti, temporary liberation. And he was quite taken aback and asked her, how did you do that? To which she replied, I just followed the instructions. That's a great lesson and one worth remembering the next time you go on a retreat or perhaps the first time you go on a retreat. 
let go, let go of any expectations of what is supposed to happen and just follow the instructions. Other teachers have described very early experiences of liberation, sometimes the very first time they meditated. They point out that sometimes it's easier for a rank beginner because their minds are not clouded by expectations of what's supposed to happen. In the Zen tradition, this is called beginner's mind. As soon as we develop an idea of what's supposed to happen in meditation, maybe by listening to a talk like this, we lose the innocence of an open mind. Liberation is not something that you strive for and achieve. It's more about the absence of something. It's more about letting go. In this case, letting go of the hindrances and our preoccupation with the self. The hindrances of greed, aversion, and delusion are simply a way of describing how we always how we want things to be other than they are. And as long as we want things to be other than they are, we will suffer. When we simply accept and rest in the present moment, no matter what's going on, we can experience a momentary liberation. So yes, you can experience liberation the first time you sit down and meditate. There's another quote from Nisargadatta about this experience. He's talking about both the temporary and, uh, and final liberation in this quote. He says, when the mind is kept away from its preoccupations, it becomes quiet. If you do not disturb this quiet and stay in it, you will find that it is permeated with the light and love you have never known. And yet you recognize it at once as your true nature. Once you have passed through this experience, you will never be the same again. The unruly mind may break its peace and obliterate its vision at times, but it is bound to return to this place provided the effort is sustained. Up until the day when all bonds are broken, delusions and attachments end and life becomes supremely concentrated in the present. End quote. But the unruly mind is persistent, isn't it? Even though liberation is just a matter of letting go, the mind has been conditioned by a lifetime of grasping, wanting, avoiding, and thinking. The idea of resting in the present moment is appealing, but in actual practice, it often makes us uncomfortable because it's so foreign to us. I'm reading a book right now called Stolen Focus. It's about the growing problem of attention deficit in our culture. And it suggests that the, this, this is the root of our addiction to screens. Even before screens came along, T.S. Eliot said, we are distracted from distraction by distraction. And because our culture has turned us into well-conditioned consumers, we try to make liberation a project, a goal, something to achieve. As an aside, I ran into a friend while walking my dog in a park today. And we were talking about the news from the current Ukraine, and she said that she was so upset that she was trying to read her way out of it. And I knew exactly what she meant by that. It's like, maybe if I just keep inform myself better, I'll find some understanding and peace. But actually, she was so distracted that so distracted and distressed that she was turning to additional distraction for relief. 
She acknowledged that the strategy wasn't working. So I suggested that what might be more healing is simply sitting in the sun and watching the dogs play. The Burmese teacher Utejaniya points out that when wisdom is present, there is no frustration, disappointment, or depression because some goal has not yet been reached. There's just the appreciation that this moment is the goal. If you want something else to be happening, that is greed or aversion. Think about your meditation this evening. Reflect back on your meditation. If it was in any way unsatisfactory, it's probably because you wanted something else to be happening. Perhaps tranquility or peace of mind. If, on the other hand, you were able to accept your experience just as it was, even with mental turmoil or physical discomfort, you may have experienced liberation tonight. Adya Shanti says, it's not what you think. It's much, much less. It's not what you think. It's much, much less. I love that quote because it can be read two ways. It can mean liberation is not what you believe it to be. Or it can also mean you're not going to get there by thinking. You don't need to make something happen. You don't need to make your mind quiet. You simply need to learn to notice when it is quiet. I propose that everyone in this room, including yourself, has experienced Sido Vimuti, or temporary liberation of mind. And you probably experienced it long before you started meditating, but you just didn't recognize it. It's the experience of sitting in nature and watching a beautiful sunset when you're simply transfixed by the momentary experience. You're not wishing for it to be anything other than it is, and it's not all about you. A single flower can trigger it or a cloud drifting across the sky. In his wonderful book, On Earth, We Are Briefly Gorgeous, the, the author Ocean Vuong describes this experience when he recalls an earthenware pot of tulips that stopped me in the middle of my mind. An earthenware pot of tulips that stopped me in the middle of my mind. Now, most of us would have described seeing a beautiful vase of flowers. But Ocean Vuong recognized that the significant aspect of that experience was that his mind stopped. So the next time you're transfixed by something, in addition to noticing the thing itself, pay attention also to the effect it has on your mind. Pay attention to anything that stops you in the middle of your mind and appreciate that experience. It is a felt experience, not a thought. And it can only happen in the present moment. In Buddhism, we sometimes call this momentary experience suchness, suchness. The great Zen master Dogen advises that you should cease from practice based on intellectual understanding, pursuing words and following after speech, and learn the backward step that turns your light inwardly to illuminate yourself. Body and mind of themselves will drop away and your original face will be manifest. If you want to attain suchness, you should practice suchness without delay.
the Pali word for suchness is Tathata. One of the honorific names for the Buddha is the Tathagata, he who experiences suchness. Suchness is always present. It's the nature of things. We only need to learn to recognize it. And when we do, we can cultivate it. It's temporary liberation. Experience the essence of something, including your own mind, without all the commentary, judging, and attachment. It's not just a meditative, meditative experience. Suchness can happen during any daily activity, such as when you're washing the dishes. Washing the dishes, hands in warm water, soapy water is like this. It's a wonderful gift to recognize suchness. And we can create the conditions for it to happen. Slow down. Don't multitask. Be mindful and pay attention. Basically, just follow the instructions that mindfulness teachers offer here every week. We are training our minds to be liberated. A lovely side effect of simply dwelling in the present moment is happiness. Simply being present is in itself a condition for happiness. Another honorific name for the Buddha is Saparisa or happy guy. I've been studying the Anapanasati Sutta where the Buddha describes three types of happiness that arise in practice and in everyday life, sometimes sequentially. The first type of happiness is joy sometimes translated as rapture. Piti is the Pali word. It's very energetic happiness. It's perhaps a kind of happiness that we think of when we recall feeling really happy. It's also probably the top type of happiness that we think of that we think might be missing in our lives. It has an excited quality. The second type of happiness is sukha in Pali. Sukha is translated simply as happiness or contentment. This is a calmer, more settled happiness. It's the happiness that arises when we are simply present without our usual preoccupations content with, the, with things just as they are. It's considered a superior happiness to joy because while it's also temporary, it can last quite a long time. Sukha, by the way, is the opposite of dukkha. And the third, most highly cherished type of happiness is even calmer yet. It's translated as gladness. I like to think that this quality of happiness is what we sometimes refer to as inner peace. The venerable Analio, the esteemed Buddhist monk and translator, says that joy is like a rushing mountain stream cascading down toward a lake. Sukha or contentment is like the surface of the lake. It's comparatively more tranquil than the rushing stream. While gladness or inner peace is like the lake below the surface, very still, quiet.
So happiness isn't always about getting what we want and having things go our way. Simply being present is a prime condition for happiness. Gratitude is also a condition for the arising of happiness. So I highly recommend gratitude as a daily practice if you're looking to improve your mood. Happiness, like all conditioned things, is temporary. We can't flip a happiness switch. We, we can create the conditions for happiness to arise. Mindfulness, which conditions us to stay present, is the best place to start. So why am I talking about happiness and liberation when such terrible things are happening in the world? Because the Buddha did so. And he lived in tough times as well. War wiped out the Buddha's entire clan in his lifetime. Dukkha, which we call suffering or unreliability, is a characteristic of human existence. We will suffer and the world will suffer. Old age, illness and death are always shadowing us and our loved ones. Nations make war on each other and racism and injustice persist despite our efforts to eradicate them. But our efforts do make a difference. Just as I practice the five recollections every day, I also remind myself that it is the nature of the world to suffer. Something is always going wrong somewhere. I believe that I'm a realist rather than a pessimist. When I can acknowledge my own suffering and that of the world, I tend to meet it with compassion rather than rage and despair. This is the way things are right now. As one of the great teachers in our tradition likes to say in response to pretty much any phenomena that arises, he says, it's like this. But the Buddha reminds us that even in the midst of our suffering, we can be present. just as we did tonight in our set. Peace is available at any moment, no matter what's going on in our lives or in the headlines. And if we can establish embodied presence, as we said, if only for a few minutes at a time, we can also experience contentment, happiness, and yes, sometimes even liberation. I'm so very grateful to be on a spiritual path that places such a high value on happiness and tranquility. We talk a lot about dukkha, but the Buddha famously said, I teach only suffering and the end of suffering. So tonight, let's place the emphasis on the end of suffering. I'm also grateful to be sharing the Dharma and this path with all of you, my spiritual friends at Mission Dharma. I deeply believe that cultivating our practice and staying on this path toward liberation makes the world a better place. Peace starts within. So, Thank you for your kind attention. Those are my thoughts on liberation and happiness. I hope they might be an antidote for any suffering that you might be experiencing. And just keep in mind that too, that 
Like all other conditioned phenomena, suffering's temporary also. This too shall pass. We have <clears throat> a little time. I'm wondering if anyone has a comment or question. Reflection on anything that I've said. Um, I can't see everybody's face, so you might have to um, either put it in the chat or simply unmute yourself and speak right up. Hopefully we'll, we won't talk over each other. Isaac's hand is up. Isaac, please. Hi, everybody. Um, thank you, David. That was beautiful. Um, I, I like how you, 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 how did you say this? Um, I've been doing, a, 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 during my meditation, I've been doing a lot of, oh, I'm noticing thinking, oh, I'm noticing this, oh, I'm noticing, I've been noticing all the things that I um, um, sort of don't want to happen. <laughs> I'm noticing this, oh, I'm noticing the judge judging the judge, you know. And I, I like how you said, turned it around a little bit and said, um, notice the silence and the, the stillness and um, um, looking forward to shifting my my sort of attention 180 degrees, if you will, and, and seeing if that bears fruit. Um, and also, um, you know, I, I, you, you mentioned, and, and I hear this all the time, of turning something like turning your attention inward um, um, and it's, for some reason that just I don't I don't grasp that I'm, I'm sure I'm making more of it than it is at least I think I'm making more of it than it is maybe you can speak more to what you mean by turning inwards turning your attention inwards yeah it, re it really is um simpler than you probably think and simpler than I make it sound. And turning, turning our attention inwards, uh, I guess most fundamentally for me means simply paying attention to our body um, rather than the mind. Uh, simply noticing, because uh, that grounds us right in the present moment. So turning our attention inward is, is, is um, noticing what's going on in the body and also noticing the mind only as changing phenomena, uh, but not paying so much attention to um, our thoughts about things. Um, or say in this Zoom meeting with all these lovely faces on the screen, um, paying attention to the faces. Um, it's easy to kind of get ungrounded, I find, in, in Zoom meetings and in Sangha. When, when we um, used to meet live in Sangha, um, my memory is kind of sitting and staring at the back of somebody's head. And now in a Zoom meeting, we're looking at all these faces and that, that stirs things up a bit. But as to the first part of your question, I'm, I'm really glad you, you mentioned that because I, I do so want to emphasize that is we we're not conditioned to pay attention to the quiet moments. Um, basically, we have a, a um, a negativity bias. And we notice, um, as you described so beautifully, beautifully, Isaac, we have a negativity bias. We notice what's wrong. We notice what we want to be different. We notice what's challenging. Um, and we don't notice so much when things are just all right, when we're at peace, when, when we're sitting in quiet. And in fact, in our busy world, when we're so distracted, um, when we have those moments of peace, I think sometimes we fill them in very rapidly. And you see this in real life every day. You see, you see people walking down the street, looking at their phones because just walking down the street isn't enough for them. That walking down the street can be a, a peaceful, lovely, restful experience. But in our busy world, in our busy minds, it's not enough for people. So we have these devices that distract us. Sorry, I'm kind of obsessed with this because I'm reading, reading a book about distraction right now. It interests me. So notice the moments of quiet. Notice when nothing's going on. I noticed it the other day when I was reading a book and uh, I was really caught up in, in the book. And then I kind of decided that I'll 
it's time to stop and do something else. And I shut the book. And before I um, got up and did something else, I just noticed that there's a moment of peace, right? My mind just kind of went still because it was done with the book, but it hadn't moved on to the next task. So I just sat. I just did sit. I did a mini sit for 10 or 15 minutes. And it was beautiful. I just took that opportunity, thought, okay, in between the book and doing the dishes or whatever came next, there's peace. So we can train ourselves to find moments of quiet and uh, and appreciate them, cultivate them. So thank you for the thank you for those comments. Anyone else? Everybody doing more or less okay with um, holding the, the news of the day? Maybe that's too big of a question. I hope that meditation tonight was uh, a reminder that we can take a break from worrying about the world. A reminder that we can take a break from worrying about our own life problems simply by resting in our body and being quiet. Well, if there are no David, other, yes. David, Fred, Fred has his hand up. Fred, please. Hi, David. Thank you for the talk. What what I one thing I hear you saying is um, is uh, that I have trouble with is noticing the moments, those quiet moments when I'm not clinging, when I'm not attached, when I'm the brief moments instead of focusing on those moments when I'm caught. Um, and I think in a, times like this. Um, you know, I tend to reach out to, like, like your, like your friend, to reach out to the negativity and um, miss miss those beautiful moments in between. Um, yeah, uh, I've started turning off the news and just watching it once a day or checking in once a day instead of kind of several times a day. Um, that seems helpful, and just to spend more time outside, spend more time with my dog or whatever, and. Um, Anyway, thanks for thanks for the talk. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're welcome, Fred. Yeah, I I endorse that. Um, just you know, spend maybe ten minutes with the news, um, rather than getting your news from social media, which is can be very um, a lot of distraction. Um, you know, good old fashioned newspapers like the which are online now, the New York Times, the Washington Post, or the Guardian, or whatever curate our news for us. And um, I'm reminded that in, in the olden days when I was young, you got a newspaper in the morning and you spent a half an hour reading it and then you put it down and that was the news for the day. <clears throat> and now we have 24-7 uh, uh, generating news, which is pretty unsettling. But you can kind of treat it like uh, the old-fashioned newspaper. You just spend 15 minutes, half an hour with the news every day and trust that you'll catch up with the rest of it the next day. That's good advice. It's also self-care times like this. Any other hands up? Well, we're, we're coming to the close of our evening and I want to um, offer the merit of our practice as we do every week. I just want to acknowledge uh, those two million refugees and send them our metta and our compassion. May they be safe. 
from danger and harm and protect it. May they be nourished and healthy in their journey to finding safety. May they find refuge, a place of peace and ease. May they and all beings everywhere be free of suffering. May it be so. Thank you, and good night, everybody. May you go in peace. Thank you. Thank good night. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, David. Good night, everyone. Good, good night, night everyone. everyone. Thank you. Good night.